So now I'd like to welcome Lina Green to introduce our funders panelists. Lina is a co-founder of an angel investment network called Angel of Impact, which is focused on women and indigenous-led social enterprises in the ethical textile and regenerative agriculture sectors. She is deeply committed to advancing racial justice in investing and serves on the investor tax force of Jedi Collaborative. Lina, please take it away. Thank you very much. Wow, what a dynamic conversation. So many insights and calls for actions. So now we lead on to the funders panel and it takes a, from the or a keynote speech around the system isn't broken, it is working for those it was designed for. We all know that the food system was designed to exploit land and people, especially people of color. Yet while we have a lot of initiatives around regenerative agriculture, there's still not enough about regenerative finance and how we can heal finance for people with these amazing entrepreneurs that we have, right? There's also conversations you heard about whether impact investing from a do good, do well uh, perspective is actually still extractive. Uh, resourceful, resilient entrepreneurs uh, have been known to do 20% more revenue with 50% less capital. How can we keep the capital back into growth for the community and the entrepreneur? Um, just to touch on the concept of Jedi, so diversity and inclusion expert Verna Myers actually called diversity as being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. Uh, but Jedi adds the point of justice and equity as well. And one could ask yourself, whose dance is it? Does someone have an advantage in that dance? Do we need to create a new dance and address the issues of justice as well so that everyone benefits? Though in one party suffers, it's not the suffering of just one, but all, all. How can we shift that conversation? We're very delighted to have an amazing panel. Uh, first, we're going to have Jenna Nicholas, who is also going to serve as the moderator for the panel. And Jenna is the co-founder and CEO of Impact Experience, which builds bridges between investors and entrepreneurs focused on bias and structural racism. She is an investor and collaborator with Illumin Capital, and impact fund of funds focus on bias reduction. She is also the vice president of One Planet VC, focusing on investing in early stage companies in transformative industries. Next, we have Leslie Lindo, portfolio manager of the Alamina Fund at Candida Group, to address the lack of access to capital for communities that have faced decades of historical extraction. Before joining Candida, Leslie worked at Common Future, where she brought together diverse stakeholders around racial equity and impact investing. Then we have Tiffany Brown, co-founder of Cordata Capital, which supports investors in moving money off from Wall Street into community investments that center racial and economic justice. Before entering the world of finance, she was deeply involved in the nonprofit world around social justice work and youth leadership. We were supposed to have Donald Daniels with us, the VP of Philanthropic Service from RSF Social Fund, Fund Finance. Unfortunately, she's been hit by the storm on the East Coast and had lost connectivity, and she sends her apologies. So with that, Jenna, I'm gonna pass the panel on to you. Fantastic. It's such a pleasure to be here today with, with all of you and wonderful to hear from everybody so far. And so I'm going to kick off with a few questions and give a chance to um, Leslie and Tiffany to share some responses and we'll also share a bit from, from our perspective as well. And so the first question um, I'd love to ask Leslie first um, is what are some of the deeper nuances that funding organizations need to consider and what strategies to use to overcome them. So we'll have um, Leslie and then Tiffany and then I'll share some remarks, but over to you, Leslie. Great, thanks, Jenna. I mean, I think really a lot of this was already brought up during the uh, keynote uh, conversation between Rodney and Kelly, um, but I think it really um, is focused on how we're disrupting the traditional power dynamics and, um, and a lot of that looks like making sure that the decision making is held with those who have the lived experience of the communities being served and, you know, believing that, you know, they're the ones who are best positioned to ensure that the needs to ensure that the needs of the communities are being met. Um, we also, you know, focus on how we're addressing the lack of, of access to capital and how we're creating vehicles that build both individual and community wealth. So I think lifting up a lot of those themes again that were brought up earlier. And I think for us, you know, as we're looking at our investments, I mean, first we actually have to do a reflection on ourselves. 
um, and you know where we might be upholding the disruptive systems and where we're centering whiteness. Um, that's that's just a really real examination that has to happen, I think, across every organization and with investors. Um, and then I think, uh, secondly, for us, it's you know really making sure that we're not taking a dogmatic approach to how we structure and um, shape our terms. So really trying to lead each investment with you know where it needs to be and how to best be supportive of those companies and supporting their mission. So sometimes the um, the design means that the ownership is allowed to stay with the companies um, through vehicles like a purpose trust. Um, and then also you know really looking at what terms are best suited to support the sustainability and health of the balance sheet of the companies. Um, so I think that's really kind of where we're looking at structure and terms. And then it's also really looking at where we have opportunities to be catalytic with our investments. So sometimes that means taking a subordinate position, um, bringing in other partners to the deal um, who we know can trust and best serve that organization and will keep their priorities in mind. Um, and then uh, limiting to the extent possible to any restrictions on our capital so that, I mean, I think what we find with, with companies that's most challenging is that, you know, they're not really able to use the funding to support a broad range of operational needs, um, particularly when we look at um, investments in, in CDFIs and other private funds. Um, and then I think the other aspect that's really important is partnering with and investing in organizations who are going to provide the deep technical assistance that's needed to um, support the viabilities of the organizations for the long term. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Leslie. Tiffany, would love your reflections as it relates to kind of looking at the nuances that funding organizations need to consider and how what strategies to overcome them. Yeah. So. Our full title is Cordata Capital Investment with a Backbone. And, you know, some of the ways that we actually started our business is taking a more historical um, look at wealth accumulation in the United States. And we're really lucky that most of our clients, um, and then also we have this nine month learning program that we run for people with inherited wealth, but, um, they're accredited investors. They have an explicit commitment to racial justice. And if we want to look at um, what it actually takes to repair this fracture in our economic system, where there's an incredible racial wealth gap, um, we need to actually look at the returns. And so one of our funding strategies is to really work with our clients and to ensure that they don't, um, just move forward with the automatic assumptions that happen in investment and in finance, but actually that our clients oftentimes will come in at the very lowest, like 0%, 0.1%. Um, so that's one example. Another way, um, because as we mentioned in preparation for this webinar, um, we mostly invest in CDFIs and loan funds, um, but it was so inspiring to hear the entrepreneurs speak uh, before we came on. And what I realized is that while there's um, a bit of a, uh, a limitation because our capacity really allows us to mostly perform due diligence on these loan funds where there's more diversification and everything, that when I think about one of our core commitments, which is to um, center the leadership of black women, from the very beginning, we've developed this beautiful relationship with Runway Project that was deeply um, working with Black entrepreneurs. And it's through those kinds of alliances um, that I think our proximity to understanding some of the, the very basic needs that Black entrepreneurs have helps us to um, move more in alignment as we organize our investment community and also as we build this relationship with Runway, shout out to Nina Robinson, Jessica Norwood, um, that we're teeing up the work of these incredible black women who are working so hard to disrupt finance. And um, our community has actually not just thrown down with investment capital, but also as they, um, reckon with the history of racism are also coming in with grant dollars out, outside of like our work with them as um as clients but that's the expression of their deep commitment 
That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. And um, I can share just a little bit in terms of from the perspective of some of the organizations and communities that, that we partner with. So one of the organizations that we work with that Lina mentioned, um, Illumin Capital, which is a impact investing fund of funds that's focused on bias reduction. Uh, and in collaboration with them and our research partners at Stanford um, commissioned a research paper that was all focused around looking at these questions around bias and, and asset allocation and how investments are made. And when we look at the $69 trillion that are invested annually, you know, less than 2% are invested into women and people of color. And the, the need to really sort of think about the shifts that are taking place, as has been you know, referenced this morning, and as Leslie and Tiffany have, have mentioned, um, the need to really have a kind of systemic approach to engaging around this. And so the reason that Illumin has focused on kind of fund managers as that, that tool is, of course, if we can influence how investors are making these decisions in the same way that um, you know, Tiffany was just sharing around the cohorts of funders going through, through the programs that they run, but the power of actually shifting the way investors are thinking about their investment selection, board selection, hiring, retention, um, we're able to kind of shift that across the ecosystem. And then and, and it's building off what Tiffany was sharing in terms of this piece around reckoning with history, a lot of our, our core work at, at Impact Experience is around building these opportunities for proximity to actually ground in history and to recognize how do we actually get to where we are right now? Because unless, you know, as has been mentioned, unless we're really able to look at the systems that have led us to where we are today, so the history of lynching and slavery and present day manifestations in mass incarceration and police brutality, being able to draw that line and then more, more broadly in the conversation we're having today around um, bias and investing and, and decision making, uh, we won't be able to address the issue. So we, we bring groups now in a virtual context um, to Montgomery, Alabama to connect uh, with people in the community and to be guided by the voices of people who are working on the the front lines um, in this work as, as part of this broader kind of ecosystem of engagement. So those are just a couple of reflections, but we'd love to transition now onto our, our next question, um, which is looking at what tools has your organization used to effectively fund and address racial equity? Um, and we'd love to, to hand over to, to Leslie to share some reflections on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, going back to first how we're disrupting the traditional um, power dynamics, one of the things that we've done with our loan fund, for example, is to establish a community advisory board uh, where we have representation from across the country um, who really understand the needs of the communities where we lend, who are the ones who are guiding our strategy for that fund, um, and who are uh, contributing to the decisions about who we actually invest in. So um, how we're prioritizing our pipeline and which deals we're actually approving, um, that's really gonna come at the end of the day from um, you know, the, the say of the community advisory board. Um, and we're also looking, you know, not only do we do an impact assessment of our prospective investees, but we're also doing an impact assessment or looking to build an impact assessment of our investors. So really, you know, um, who are we going to be in partnership with? These are long-term relationships and, you know, where we have the opportunity to um, you know, prevent harm in the communities where we're trying to serve. We see that as, part, as a big part of our role. Um, so really, you know, being mindful about, um, you know, the dollars that we're taking in. And again, you know, working with the community advisory board to actually improve who the investors will be um, in that loan fund. And then also, you know, shifting the expectation of an exit strategy in return. So I think, you know, we talked about that a little bit. So, you know, how can ownership stay within the organization? And, you know, how can we minimize, um, you know, and reduce the, term, the terms that the investors are expecting? Because, you know, again, we're trying to move away from that, that extractive um, system. So, and I think the other aspects that are, you know, really important, you know, that I touched upon in the last part is looking, evaluating who's in the leadership position. So that is across the board, that's who's running the organization. Um, you know, again, how, how are we lifting up the communities that have been most extracted and, and historically excluded from the economy? Um, and then looking at, you know, who are the workers that they're bringing into the organization? How are they supporting, um, you know, communities that are left out. 
Um, and then also, how are we creating wealth for even the supply chain? So, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's going all the way down. And then what is the access of the co consumers for those products? So, you know, really taking that holistic assessment. Um, I think, you know, that more from the, the companies where we have an equity investment. Um, and then when we're looking at our debt investments, again, you know, with the CDFIs, I think it's very similar. And looking at the representation from those organizations and how they're going Going, you know, beyond just um, the lending capital, but how they're actually advocating for those communities. So I think, you know, having those tools for evaluation are really, um, are really important as we're considering our investment. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tiffany, what are your reflections around tools that you're engaged to address racial equity? Yeah, well, so one thing that came to mind and um, this is really building on what you were sharing, Leslie. Um, it's like that there's a lot of power in being an investor. And so as we're doing that, um, you know, scan of who's on staff, who's in leadership, who's on the board of these different loan funds, um, that we're really in a position to agitate. And if we're happy with what it is that we see, we can still agitate further and really push people on um, what the commitment is to racial justice. And um, that's been a really like a, a powerful learning for me and my business partner, Kate Poole, as we've stepped into this role of building our firm. Um, we've been around for two years now. Um, the other piece is that as we were developing Core Data Capital, we realized that for the most part, um, investment has been a very individualistic endeavor. For example, an investment advisor knows that their client likes um, food and farming and they're like, great, we'll like put together this like food and farming portfolio. But when we think about um, the role of collective action, um, kind of drawing upon some of the principles that happen in grassroots organizing and bringing those over into finance, we decided that we would roll with a model portfolio that all of our clients get into the same investment. So any, any relationship that we're developing with, let's say runway project, it's not just um, our client who's like, I care about black people that gets invested in runway project. We're actually bringing our entire community with us. Um, so that's another tool, which is a, I think a unique approach. Um, we also do longer term investments um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, plant the seed that there needs to be some level of philanthropic dollars that come in. When we're talking about an economy that works for everyone, um, we need to kind of have our, our eyes on the prize of what's the long game? Where are we going together? So for example, um, we really love and care about um, an institution called Seed Commons. And, um, and also, and these are not investment recommendations. These are just uh, organizations that I love. Um, with the Ujima project, coming in at the seven year note, coming in at the 10 year note, if you have that risk tolerance. Um, and then the final thing I'll say, as far as a tool, is I mentioned the importance of really like um, lifting up the work of others. So lifting up the work of Runway Project, lifting up the work of Seed Commons. Um, and we, have such incredible relationships with these institutions, but we don't want to be gatekeepers. And so when we created the Cordata cohort that we run, um, there was this way that what we were doing is teeing up the relationships, like teeing up these beautiful investment opportunities so that people could understand that they're a part of a community and understand that we're going somewhere together. Well, now in the era of COVID, and I don't think we're going to be able to do the same kind of um, in-person cohort, we had already been thinking that we would transition to a, a web series that we would host for our clients and also for our um, alumni from the cohorts that we led so that they could continue to be inspired by the work that's happening on the ground, either investment opportunities or just like beautiful um, anti-capitalist, like black led rad projects that are happening across the country. So those are some of the tools that we're using. Thank you, thank you. And just to really build off that and a lot of the reflections around kind of power and I think the importance of having a power analysis and engaging 
in this work and even recentering how we think about power and what constitutes power is a, you know incredibly important aspect of this and the given the sort of increase in the importance and the recognition that we can't kind of continue in the way that, that we have you know we found that to be i mean it's even just testimony the fact that we have you know over 150 people that have kind of joined this conversation today that i think a deep kind of craving on the part of so many people to be able to work out you know what are the tools to be able to engage in creating intentional spaces for people to be able to to do that and and recognizing the role of kind of culture and the arts in that process and so that become something that it's not just a transactional way of engaging between investors and entrepreneurs but actually kind of thinking about asset creation from a much kind of broader perspective you know feels like a, a really important aspect you know in these in these times and i think furthermore that the idea that when we think about what tools can be effective that we're not thinking about short-term tools i think that you know so often when people are asking these questions it can be like, oh what is the checklist that i can use or what is the two-hour training program that I can take part in, um, but actually realizing that this is deep, long-term, as was mentioned, like personal um, and interpersonal and organizational and kind of systemic work. Um, so on the part of Illumin Capital, they require you know, 10 years of commitment on the part of the fund managers to engage in this bias reduction work for exactly this reason. And I know Donna wasn't able to join us um, today, but just to give a kind of shout out both to the work that they're engaged in at, at RSF, but also more broadly, the role of philanthropic capital is part of this conversation and engagement, um, both as it relates to providing opportunities for that early stage kind of discretionary capital to support around research and development, um, but also to support around research to be making the case for why this is all important. So I think as we think about kind of blended capital um, models that think, realizing that we all have a role to play within the ecosystem and being able to kind of match the right capital to the kind of opportunities. Um, so one more question that I have, and then we'll open up to some questions from, um, from the audience. Uh, so we'd love to learn a bit more around kind of your, your funders, the motivations and how uh, investors and fund managers can find more racial equity deals. Uh, so back to you, Leslie. Great. I mean, well, we um, are very fortunate to work with um, funders who are very values aligned. I mean, I think that's, you know, real, that's very intentional on our part, um, knowing that, you know, we are, you know, kind of pushing the envelope of what folks traditionally consider as risk. Um, you know, particularly, you know, with the, um, the leaders of the organizations we're investing in or the types of um, of projects um, they're producing. And so, um, you know, so working with folks who are willing to step out of, of that lens and, and understand that the long-term capital is, is really what's needed in this space and what it means to be a true partner um, when you're looking at, you know, as Tiffany said, you know, seven years or, or longer. Um, and, you know, really also, you know, ones who are who trust us and in and, and our decision. Um, you know, uh, Candide itself is um, an investment advisory group. And so really, you know, kind of that's, that's our role. Um, so really, you know, folks who have come to us because they understand that we are specifically focused on racial equity work. And, and, and I think, you know, as I was talking about from that um, impact assessment for question, you know, for the investors, you know, it's really understanding um, and trying to discern how authentic they are, um, you know, in their interest in investing in this space and, you know, how willing um, they are to really stretch their traditional beliefs. And so how, you know, can we kind of get to the bottom of that so we know that we're working with, you know, partners who are going to be with us um, in doing the deep work that's needed in these communities for the long term. Brilliant. Thank you. Tiffany? Yeah, um, I'm thinking about, you know, how we opened this discussion and Rodney sharing that, you know, the system's not broken, it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. Um, being that that's what we're working with and we know it, I feel like it's uh, imperative that investors lead from what are your core values. And so Cordata Capital, Investment with the Backbone, it leads with our commitment to racial and economic justice, shared risk and accountability. Um, and so 
the client base that we've attracted are people that are deeply committed to leading with those values. We're also quite lucky that we come out of uh, a donor organizing background. So we have a number of um, younger folks that are inheritors and that have pretty anti-capitalist leanings. Like they already have an analysis on capitalism and many come from resource generation that is talking about the redistribution of land, wealth, and power. And so we're, we're really blessed that in our work with our client base that really we're just kind of helping people stay on track and slowing down those moments where finance can really get you twisted. Um, yeah, and that our, our, our client base wants repair. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. And we're coming up on time. I know there's lots of questions from different people, but we will have an opportunity in the, the breakout groups to